Grace and peace to all of you resonating lights, you echoes of the sacred one. Welcome as tonight we get into part two of heaven or hell status or location. And tonight part two would be titled heaven or hell depends on Jekyll or Hyde because tonight we will get into the story of Jekyll and Hyde. And how that is a God-like message on understanding that heaven and hell are manifest within your heart and out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks, the power of life and death lies within the tongue and so does your reality, so does where you live, so does who you impact, and so does all of your choices. Now, before diving into the story, I gave you a brief rundown of Robert Louis Stevenson, who's the author of the book, and gave you a little bit about what the story was about. But before diving in, I would be remiss not to introduce each of you to Gabriel John Utterson. He's a lawyer and is the close friend of Dr. Jekyll and their mutual friend, Dr. Lanyon, for many years. He is the protagonist of our story. He is, what we will learn, is the seeker. He's acting as God, and Gabriel is an appropriate name as could be given to this character, as we know that Gabriel being another name for God manifesting Himself in this earth to the children of God, to the people of God. Gabriel, in this story, is doing the same thing. He's an always measured and emotionless bachelor who nonetheless seems believable, trustworthy, tolerant of the faults of others, and genuinely likable. However, Utterson is not immune to guilt, as even though he is tasked with investigating and judging the faults of others as an attorney, Stevenson would write that he was humbled to the dust by the many ill things he had done. We don't know what those ill things are, but whatever they may have been, we know from the story that he does not participate in gossip or in the other views of the upper class out of respect for his fellow man. He's a man with a storied past that has brought him to his own rock bottom, and he's built up from there a different sort of being entirely. A being seemingly fit for the task of discovering both the heaven and hell that comes from the abundance of another's heart. A discovery that unlocks an understanding for us all. Not just the example chosen in this story. Mr. Utterson is one who will often recognize the ill things around him and repurposes them as information. This information both informs his opinions and forms him into a formidable protagonist of the story. Stevenson would write this about Utterson's character. He had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds, and in any extremity inclined to help rather than to reprove. My, 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 the state of our beings if the church were quick to help rather than to reprove. Because people are living in a hell of their own making. They've already made it as bad as they could possibly make it for themselves, or they're on the precipice of making it worse. How much better would we be suited to stand in the position of tolerating those faults and standing in the position of help rather than the position of judgment and reproving them for their actions? See, this ties into another notion, another principle that we've talked about before from Friedrich Nietzsche in his writing of Beyond Good and Evil, we learned this, and we've taught about this, but it's worth repeating here. The strength of a person's spirit 
would then be measured by how much truth he could tolerate. Or more precisely, to what extent he needs to have it diluted, disguised, sweetened, muted, or falsified. Because we know that Mr. Utterson as an attorney has done ill wills of his own. He's done ill things. He's done things that he regrets that have reproved him as is the purpose of our mistakes and shortcomings and shortcomings. Our failures teach us how to be something that overcomes the obstacle, not succumbs to the power of it. He's able to confront those at their worst moments, facing their worst, biggest obstacles in the criminal justice system, in the legal world, in the legal context. Consequences that affect your freedom, your liberty, your right to earn a living, your right to be with your family. And without having to have those faults diluted, disguised, sweetened, muted, or falsified, we see that the measure or the strength of Mr. Utterson's spirit is great. We all know that it's our humanity that is fragile, but it's our spirit that is strong. And the measure of his spirit is great. In this story, like in Jonah, we will see that the disasters that block the way of your disobedience are harder than the difficulties you face in performing God's will. There's something to be said here. We talked about Jonah. And Jonah, as he ran or escaped from the presence of God, he was hiding away, hiding from God, instead of hiding his faults in God to be what he was supposed to be to the Ninevites and to everyone else he encountered. We see in that moment that Jonah is running from God, but psychologically we can say he's running from a moral standard. He's running from a morality, a moral test that he's been weighed and measured and he's found wanting. Saving the Ninevites is not a truth from God he can tolerate. He needs something to sweeten it or dilute it. And God says, no. This is what you are called to do. This is your purpose. This is the truth you have to accept about who you are. And if you don't, the strength of your spirit will wane and you will suffer the consequences. You'll face those difficulties of your disobedience. And we talked Sunday about how that happened and how that worked out. And how that defined heaven and hell as a status instead of a location. In the heart of the man swallowed by the great fish. Here, like the children of Israel, our enemies come from within our own households. Mr. Utterson would quaintly say, I incline to Cain's heresy. I let my brother go down to the devil in his own way. On most occasions, Mr. Utterson was the last reputable acquaintance and the last good influence in the lives of what the book would call downgoing men. But so long as the downgoing came about his chambers, he never marked a shade of change in his demeanor. To live in the truth that you are just as capable of the ill things done by the downgoing is truly to demonstrate the strength inherent in humility and meekness. This is the hallmark of one living in the position of, of the mendicant we talk about in Matthew 5 and 3. The mendicant is the poor in spirit. comes from a Greek combination of tochos, meaning to crouch, to lower oneself, to place, to a place to humbly ask for your need, or more intuitively, to be available to meet your own and the needs of others. And that's combined with pneuma, meaning breath. So those who breathe in the humility of all the potential ills they are capable of, breathe into others the relatable truth that would make them free. 
First, we have to take in to ourselves truth that's uncomfortable. Truth that hurts. Truth that's hard. Truth that we wished could be sweetened or diluted to make it more palatable, to make it easier to tolerate. The reality is, is that's not the way this works. Because by grappling and confronting that difficult truth, that hard thing, that thing you want to go up against, the very least, it's the last thing that you want to do. It makes you into the being that has a truth to give to others for them to be free. Because it's never just about you. Your victory will inspire other victories. When you stand in your victory, you create other victors. Because like we talked about with the gladiators, everyone is watching. They're paying attention. When they see victory, they want to know how you obtain that victory. This is how. This is how we get here. Mr. Utterson, as an advocate, gives place to those who hide from their true being and then ultimately have to hide from the consequences of being less than who they are. In this, we see the reflection and hear the echo of the Almighty, our great advocate, who says, stop hiding from yourself, stop hiding from the consequences, stop hiding from me, and start hiding in me. And I will find you. And you will find yourself. You will find your purpose. And you will find your meaning in all things. That is the great hope we have in believing there is a God. Because if God couldn't reveal those things to us, what do we need God for? He reveals to us how limitless we can be through the limitation of all we're not. Because we can be both limited and limitless. Good and evil. We can manifest heaven or we manifest hell. To that point, let's turn to 1 John chapter 2 and let's discuss Christ, our advocate, as we discuss the advocate of Dr. Jekyll in the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Chapter 2, verse 1 reads, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not, that you don't miss the mark. That when your opportunity is presented to you, you excel. You hit the target. And if any man should miss the target, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He is the propitiation, which comes from the word hilasteron. Hilasterion. Concretely, that's been trans literated to mean the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. The only other occurrence of hilasterion in the New Testament is in Hebrews 9, verse 5, where it is translated as the mercy seat. The mercy seat was sprinkled with blood on Yom Kippur. We know this from Leviticus 16 and 14, representing that the righteous sentence of the law had been executed, changing a judgment seat into a seat of mercy. Hebrews 9, verses 11-15. through 15. The new covenant, the literal offerings of the ritual are replaced by the obedience of Christ. Which is to say that the complete self-giving, first that of Christ and then that of His people, is the true meaning of sacrifice. All of that from propitiation. But He is that propitiation. He is that obedience that takes the place of literal offerings of rituals of man. For our missing the mark and not sharing in the prize. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So again, the, the theme that it's not just about you comes from God. It's not just ours, those that believe. It's the whole world. It's everyone that has the potential to believe if only we will be who we should be. If we can tolerate the truth Jesus gives us, then we become the truth we give to others. That's a process. 
Verse 3, And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He, he that saith, I know Him, and keepeth, which comes from the word terio, meaning to keep an eye on. So, I know Him, and I keep an eye not. I'm not paying attention. I'm not walking circumspectly. I'm not using my vision, or I'm not using my sight for the purposes of having a vision. Then you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. Why? Because you're lying to yourself. Willful blindness is a lie to oneself. You refuse to see what's right in front of you to see. You refuse to visualize the perception of your reality, the potential of your being. And because of that, you lack vision and you perish. That's what we're told. Verse 5, But whoso watches keeps an eye on his word. In him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith abideth, he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to talk even as or to walk even as he walked. So let's get into the plot behind the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You've, I've introduced you to the protagonist for the reason of drawing the parallel that Gabriel Utterson is Jesus. He's the advocate of the story. He is the one who seeks the one who's hiding. The book kicks off with a great heading for a chapter. It's, it just reads, The Story of the Door. John 10, 9 would read, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. This whole chapter tells us who Gabriel John Utterson is. I find that parallel not to be coincidental, but providential. Of course, that is Jesus in the journey to uncovering the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde requires going through that door. If we read just one more verse, I want to consider that if Jesus is discussing who He is in John 10, verse 9, then isn't that who we are? Ask yourself that question as we read this verse. Is this who you are? Is this who Jesus tells us we are? The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Now, if we're manifesting heaven and teaching others how to do that, how is that not who we are? If we're manifesting hell, which causes us to steal, kill, and destroy, are we not plunging others into a hell? So, how much more so in the context of asking yourself that question, is Jesus talking about just Himself or is He telling you, I am this so that you can see this is who you are? I'm telling you this because this is the mirror I want you to look into. This is the reflection I want you to see. This is who you really are. In that context, do we see that the thief and the life giver are the same person? If so, that verse becomes very instructive. Because it tells you what the consequences of your actions will be. As a thief, you'll steal, kill, and destroy. As a life giver, you'll give everyone life and the abundance thereof. doesn't take power to get there. That takes real competence. As we talked about Sigmund Freud... Getting into those concepts of the id, the ego, and the superego, you see the id inside you wants nihilism and hedonistic pleasures of the natural. The superego wants morality and cultural order. And it's the ego that mediates between the two and ultimately decides. This is what Sigmund Freud believed and based a lot of his psychological understanding on in the conscious and unconscious mind. 
This is reflected in story as the night sky being chaos, the ocean being nature, the island representing culture, and then there's the individual. Hero and adversary. Usually depicted as one brother locked into combat with his twin stuck in the middle of the island. That's the basis of most of our stories. For our intents and purposes, I believe what Jesus is revealing is that you are both the thief and the I am. You are both adversary and hero. And how you confront chaos, nature, and culture will be measured by how much truth you can tolerate and push out into adventure for all that is potentially available to you. This unity of two things is echoed throughout all of creation and is encoded in story. Chaos. Represented in the positive and negative. In the positive, it's treasure. It's truth and information. The alchemist's ideal of attaining gold. The negative of chaos, dragons. Creatures that seek to hoard up the treasure, the good things that they have no use of and make no use of. In nature, we have the positive, the benevolent mother. We see this echoed in the Mother Mary, which we've talked about. It's the mother who raises her child to offer them to their death or potential life. In the negative, for nature, we have the evil queen. Think of Cinderella's mother figure. Maleficent in the Disney movies. It's a mother who cripples their own for their own personal gain. And then with culture, we have the negative, the authoritarian tyrant. And you have the positive, the wise king. For the individual, however, there are both aspects. These are both aspects of their personality. Hero and adversary. Both are the essence of your being. The light and darkness that balances their grip on your perceptions and realities. The yin and yang. Both sides warring for dominance. So when one allows their light to seek competence, that all darkness is potential light. The struggle for power within begins to weaken when we come to the place that we are both the version of us that we are ashamed, embarrassed, and afraid to be and the version of us that we are humbled to be, content with the things we have, and courageous to be. I implore you, lay it down, all of it. All that could bring about good and all that could bring about evil. Lay out the map of your soul hidden in God. Stop hiding from it. Stop hiding from yourself. Because there is no hiding from God. Become the hero that makes the proper sacrifices to nature and bargain with the fate. Bargain for the fate for the best possible outcome. That's who we are. That's who we all should be. So we begin to see the ego strengthened by the Spirit within. If you're in alignment with the sacred, you can deal properly with the chaos and order struggling within yourself to be the I am you were designed to be. That gives you the upper hand over the thief that is you. Because the thief and the I am are in here. If I'm in alignment with the sacred, then my spirit has become strengthened. I've tolerated more truth. I've become something greater. And that something greater overtakes and overcomes the thief within. That monster that hoards the treasure can be confronted, can be overcome, and can be repurposed for light. 
So we kick off with Attorney Utterson and his cousin Richard Enfield. They're on their weekly walk. When they reach the door of a large house, which was located on a by street in the busy quarter of London, Enfield tells Utterson that months ago, at 3 o'clock in the morning, he saw a sinister-looking man named Edward Hyde. And he trampled a young girl after accidentally accidentally bumping into her. Enfield forced Hyde to pay her family a hundred pounds to avoid a scandal. Mr. Hyde brought Enfield to this door and gave him a check signed by a reputable gentleman later revealed to be Dr. Henry Jekyll. Now this is Utterson's friend and Utterson's client. So he immediately gets interested in the story. Because Dr. Jekyll is someone he respects. Dr. Dr. Jekyll is someone he represents. Dr. Jekyll is someone he has relationship with. His description, Mr. Hyde, pale and dwarfish. Giving the impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. He had a displeasing and unsettling smile. You ever met one of those folks? Don't answer this out loud. It just smiled at you. It just felt wrong. Come on, I know somebody's had that experience. I've had it before. Like, I don't know what that smile is about or what it's for, but I don't want anything to do with it. It doesn't look happy to me. He came across with a murderous mixture of timidity and boldness. And he spoke with a husky whispering and somewhat broken voice. Utterson, because he's a legal mind, he begins to fear that Hyde is blackmailing, Je- blackmailing Jekyll. Because Jekyll had come into his office and he had changed his will around to reflect that in the event of his death or disappearance, all of his estate, all of his belongings, all of his wealth, would be transferred to Edward Hyde. Now, Mr. Utterson has been around the block a few times. Like we said, he's a storied man with a storied past. He's done ill things, and he represents people who do do ill things all the time. He's in the business of things not, mm, not smelling right. Doesn't pass the smell test. Well, to Mr. Utterson, that's the case in the story. So he sets out on an adventure, to discover what all this is about. He sits down with a Mr. Lanyon, and Mr. Lanyon is a character in the story that is a friend with both Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Utterson. These, these men are distinguished men. They're in the upper echelon of scientists and doctors and attorneys. So they're considered the upper class, and they all congregate together and run in the same circles. Both he and Lanyon are Dr. Jekyll's oldest friends, And Utterson brings Jekyll up in the conversation. It's here, right here in the story, that we see for the first time that Jekyll has been delving into things that put Lanyon off. So here's a man that's well-respected, reputable, competent, and he begins getting into some things that his other reputable, respectful, competent friend and peer gets put off by, hey, I don't know what you're getting into or what you're driving at, but I don't think it's the right things. I don't think you're getting into what you should be getting into. This this doesn't seem like this is safe or this is right. This is far out. This is a stretch. This is potentially not good. He would say that regarding Jekyll's utopian ideals, they became too fanciful for him. And that Jekyll had begun to go wrong. And go wrong in his mind and his heart. But he did assure Mr. Utterson that he hadn't thrown him away. He just hasn't seen him too, too much because of it. Because of the decisions that he was making and the road that he was traversing and the intent that he had behind what he was doing, the two friends go on separate paths. 
Now, Lanyon makes a statement at this point in the book, and he refers to the old Greek legend of Damon and Pythias. He says, Jekyll's behaviors and actions would have estranged even Damon and Pythias. Now, let's talk about what that means, because I don't know how many have read this old Greek legend, but it's a good one. This Greek legend was told originally by Aristoxenes, or more famously, Cicero, who lived in the first century and was called a virtuous pagan by the early Christian church. Orthodoxy and heresy afoot once again, as we see. The legend goes that Pythias is accused of plotting against the tyrant Dionysius of Syracuse. And he's sentenced as a result to death. Pythias accepts his sentence and is asked to be allowed to go back home and settle his affairs and tell his family goodbye. Not wanting to be tricked or taken for a fool, the tyrant refused. But then Pythias' friend, Damon, steps in. And he offers himself as a hostage in Pythias' absence to settle his affairs and say goodbye to his family. What a friend. Wow, what a friend. You stick your neck out for me. Mm. So the tyrant agreed on the condition that if Pythias doesn't return by an appointed time that they agreed upon, Damon would be executed in his stead. Well, that changes things, right? How many has got a friend that'll stick their neck out for you and they say, now, if he doesn't come through, your friend over there, we're going to take it out on you. How many of them would still be like, all right, let's do this? Mm. Not very many. When we think about that, we think about family. We think about a brother or a sister. Someone that will stick with us through thick and thin. Damon here is another illustration of God because he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. Than the one you would expect to be there in your stead and stand on your behalf and give you the opportunity and put their life at risk. You expect that to be family, but that is God. As the Bible tells us, there will be moments where our friends and family forsake us, but He won't. She won't. They won't. God won't. And all of the play Roma that's behind them. Damon agreed, despite the death toll on his head now. And Pythias was released. Dionysius was convinced that Pythias wouldn't come back, so on the appointed day of his return, the tyrant called for the execution of Damon. As the executor begins towards sealing Damon's fate and delivering the fatal blow, Pythias returns. And he stays the executioner's hands, apologizing for his delay, and he tells Damon that his ship was captured by pirates for choosing a bad path that he was warned against going down. And he just happened to be thrown overboard and had to swim to shore, avoiding the monsters of the sea that could have swallowed him up. But he makes it to the shore and he makes it to Syracuse. The tyrant Dionysius is astonished at their friendship and was so pleased that he pardoned both men. Mr. Hyde is an individual who would separate the friendship of Damon and Pythias. The story we just, we just heard. He was that sinister, that evil, that dark, that seedy, that repugnant. That even those two friends, willing to go to those lengths for each other, would separate to avoid this man. It's a, he it's a hell of a thing to say about someone. But when that person's manifesting that hell, then that rings true. So you say, what does this story, Damon and Pythias, have to do with anything that we're talking about? This is already a book that I had to read in high school or middle school. I don't really remember it. I've never read it again. All the movies are different and take weird turns. So I don't know what this has to do 
with, with the, the, the price of water in Egypt right now? Well, it seems to me that one man was willing to go against the underpinnings of the superego to accomplish a shift in power. What do I mean by that? Pythias was willing to go against the moral and cultural underpinnings of the time and do something evil to create a shift in power. Another man, represented by Damon, is willing to lay down his life for his friend. You can look at the tyrant of the story as the adversary, but that isn't really the case. Pythias is the adversary to the structure of power itself. The negative authoritarian tyrant of culture. He's an adversarial hero of sorts. So he possesses both traits. He's given over to more of the adversary than he is to the hero in the moment. As he plots the death of their king. Now his motivations may have been pure. They may have been true. But nonetheless, we all know that murder is not okay. And even if you get away with it, you really didn't get away with it. That's going to come back to haunt you. That's going to stick with you, regardless of your motivations. Pythias then can be seen as a disfigured hero, marred by a decision worthy of death to meet his ends, very Machiavellian in his pursuits. This is the art of war, demonstrated. And Damon is the hero against the negative cultural structure of power and the evil means that stands in opposition to the cultural negative that's embodied by Pythias. Why? Because the latter is his friend. It's this act of love that overcomes tyranny and evil means. This is what makes love the greatest of all. This is why God is love and heaven and hell are the manifestation of His children. Whichever you choose, He will be there and has already laid down His life for you. That price Damon paid for his friend Pythias has been paid for you by Jesus Christ. It's worth noting. So After this conversation with Mr. Lanyon, Mr. Utterson remarks, if he shall be Mr. Hyde, and I shall be Mr. Seek, quite pithy of the old attorney. See, it's God who seeks and saves the lost. The hour comes and is now when true worshipers will worship God in spirit and truth. For the Father, for God, Seek such to worship Him. It's a little less than the KJV version, but you, you all that know the, the Scripture reference were saying the KJV in your head. I know you were. When Utterson tries to discuss Hyde with Dr. Jekyll, he tells him that the man seemed hardly human. That Hyde was a foul soul that thus transpires through and transfigures its clay content like a shapeshifter. He said, if I ever read Satan's signature upon a face, it is on that of your new friend, Dr. Jekyll. As Jekyll had told him that he knew he knows Mr. Hyde, that he has a relationship with Mr. Hyde, and he's working for him and helping him conduct his experiments. In contrast, Dr. Jekyll is described as a large, well-made, smooth-faced man of 50 with a stylish look, carrying every mark of capacity and kindness. The reflection of all the potential competence within him. This good side of Henry Jekyll. This side that adheres to the moral and social norms, that lives uprightly, that goes the upward path represents all the good he could possibly be. And when he's that man, and he has been for his whole life, he has the reputation of it. People respect this man. They believe in him. They want him in their society. 
But this Mr. Hyde is an altogether different matter. But Jekyll reveals his hubris. He reveals that his ego is not mediating between the id and superego like it should. His baser instincts of the id, his animal instincts of the id, are winning the battle, winning the debate between these moral and social norms that he's lived his whole life. These standards of righteousness, holiness, perfection, etc. His hubris is revealed when he tires of his attorney's inquiries and says, I can get rid of Hyde whenever I want. So let the matter rest. It reminds me of the struggle that we all face. When you're caught dead sinner in the middle of doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. Acting and behaving in a way you shouldn't be acting and you shouldn't be behaving. Doing something that you know could cause you to miss the mark and miss out in sharing of the reward. You say, well, I haven't done it yet. So I can, I can, I can stop this before it gets there. This train that I've set down the tracks, I can stop it before it gets to the end that's not finished and prevent everything from wrecking and burning up. I, I can do that. I can put this away at any time. You know, uh, this, this bad habit that I have, it's, it's not really a habit. I mean, he's heard these conversations before. Been in church long enough to know this is, this is literally the address of anyone that you witness to that isn't ready to turn their life around. Is, hey man, I'm alright. I can be done with this life whenever I want to be done with this life. It doesn't have a hold of me like you're telling me it has a hold of me. It doesn't have its tentacles wrapped around me the way you say it does. I'm in control here. I've got the power. But we know that power can't overcome in that situation. It's only competence that will make one free. It's the truth that makes them free because it makes them confident to be free and not expect someone to free them, but to free themselves. Proverbs 21-29 would read, A wicked man, the, go the downgoing, as Utterson would say, displays a bold face, but as for the upright, he makes his way sure. The bold face sounds good. You, you can go attack the world with boldness all you want, but that confidence isn't real confidence because it's predicated on power. So what is that? Well, confidence that's predicated on power isn't confidence, it's arrogance. Pride. It leads to your fall. But when it's predicated on competence, it is confidence. Or predicated on on competence it's confidence it's not arrogance you're avoiding the arrogant you're getting into the confidence of life because you're in alignment with the sacred proverbs 2 verses 20 through 22 read follow those who follow wisdom and stay on the right path for all my godly lovers will enjoy life to the fullest and will inherit their destinies but the treacherous ones who love darkness will lose not only all they could have had, but even their souls. So can you plunge yourself into a hell in the afterlife for what seems like an eternity? I believe you can. If you love your darkness that much, then that may very well wind up being your end. The Bible says that's entirely possible. That even your soul will suffer that consequence. It's better to love Him who is love than to love the darkness that's within you. Because He put that there to save you. He put that there to give you the opportunity to save yourself. In the story, three years pass. And a servant sees Hyde beat a man named Sir Danvers Carew 
which just so happens to be another one of Utterson's clients. I hope you're seeing the common thread here that this Gabriel, this godlike representation of the advocate, just happens to be everyone's advocate. He's connected to everyone. But Hyde beats Sir Danvers crew to death, and he leaves behind half of a broken cane. The police connecting the dots between Utterson and Carew come to Mr. Utterson's house asking some questions. He leads the officers to Mr. Hyde's apartment, the door that he had discussed with his cousin, Mr. Enfield, when he had seen Mr. Hyde retreat or retire into that house, into that doorway after trampling the young girl. So Utterson leads them to Hyde's apartment, but Hyde has vanished. But they do find the other half of the broken cane, which Utterson, as the observant one, the one who's looking around, who's keeping an eye on the commandments, he knows that that is the same cane that he gifted Dr. Jekyll some years ago. Keeping that to himself as a good attorney would, he visits Jekyll, and he produces a note. The note, he tells Utterson, is allegedly written by Mr. Hyde. And the letter apologizes for the trouble that's caused. But, again, because Utterson is paying attention, and he's connected to everyone, and he's keeping an eye on everything, without judgment, just tolerating the truth that he's presented with, the information that he's given at every turn, he notices Mr. Hyde's handwriting is awfully similar to Dr. Jekyll's. There's a slight difference in the slant and the curvature of this letter and that letter, but if you hold them side by side, it looks like potentially the same hand penned that note. This led Mr. Utterson, who's, again, not standing in judgment, accepting the truths. It leads him to conclude that Jekyll forged the note to protect Mr. Hyde. See, he's still in the thought process in the throes that this Mr. Hyde has some type of hold on you. He's got something on you that he's blackmailing you with. Because this is not you. This is not who you are. This is not your potential. This is not who you've been in our community. You wouldn't do these things. I know you. How much does that sound like God's appeal to us when we're out in our own darkness, lost in our own way, thinking we can be done with it whenever we want, and He's telling us, hey, this is not you. This doesn't look like you. This disfigurement doesn't belong to you. Stop marring your visage. Stop changing what I, I created you to be. Live up to your potential. This is not who you are. What has got a hold of you? That's changing those things. And the truth is, you've got a hold of you. Your darkness. The evil that lies within that wants to manifest and wants to have its way. That's what's got a hold of you. That's what's helping make your decisions. That's what's winning in the debate between doing what's right and doing what's wrong. That's what's creating the disasters along your path of disobedience. Disobedience to what? Disobedience to who you should be. Not to some religious tenet or religious principle or dogmatic notion, but to who you should be. <sighs> Psalm 37. And I'm going to read three verses here. Verse 11, verse 22, and verse 29. Starting with verse 11. But the humble heart will inherit every promise and enjoy abundant peace. Yahweh's blessed ones receive the land, but the cursed ones will be cut off with nothing to show for themselves. The faithful lovers of God will inherit the earth and enjoy every promise of God's care, dwelling in peace forever. Jekyll has had a conversation with his friend Mr. Lanyon. He has had a conversation with his advocate, Mr. Utterson. And it seems at this point in the story to have some effect. We see a slight change 
in the character. Now, a little girl has been trampled and injured, and a man has been killed. That's already reached the high mat or the, 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 the high point or the climax, as we would say in human life, of doing the worst things you could possibly do. You hurt a child and you killed someone. Those are terrible things. You don't need to do anything else to be considered a terrible person at that point. But for two months, Dr. Jekyll reverts to his formal sociable manner. Soon, he starts refusing visitors again. He goes back into hiding. There's a reason why Robert Louis Stevenson named Dr. Jekyll's counterpart as Mr. Hyde. Because every time Hyde is out, Jekyll is in hiding. He's being hidden away from the world, hidden away from the solution, hidden away from God so that Hyde can have its way and do what he wants to do. Dr. Lanyon dies of shock at this point in the story. And it kind of throws everything for a loop. You're like, where'd that come from? Talking about a, a random left turn. Hope you were paying attention or you wound up in the wall on that one. But it comes to find out that, and you find this out later on in the story, but we'll go ahead and go into it now just for clarity's sake, is that uh, Jekyll goes to visit Lanyon as Mr. Hyde. Lanyon's never seen Hyde before. He's only heard the rumors. He's only heard the stir stories. He's never seen him, never laid eyes on him. To everyone's knowledge, the only two people that have laid eyes, or the only people that have laid eyes on this person has been Enfield, Mr. Utterson's cousin, Mr. Utterson the advocate, Dr. Jekyll, the little girl, and the man that's dead. So he's kept pretty good uh, illusion that he's not real or he's not there. He's got a different apartment in a different part of town. It's not in this part of London. It's out in Soho. He's got an address. They search that. They can't find it. He set things up in a masterful way to remain hidden. When he goes to Mr. Lanyon, he has an exchange and he winds up getting this potion. He wants Lanyon to see what happens. He drinks the potion and he becomes Dr. Jekyll again. And this puts Dr. Lanyon into a bad place. He winds up basically going into shock, having a heart attack and dying because of the weight and the gravity of what he's just seen. And now he knows his friend, who he wanted to help in the beginning but couldn't stop from going down this bad path, has become something atrocious. Has become the very thing that goes far beyond whatever fears he had for him in his experimentations. You've become the worst version of yourself. And I didn't help stop you from doing it. Maybe I could have done more. Who knows why Mr. Lanyon winds up succumbing and dying in that moment. But the information is so great, the gravity and the weight of the scenario is so heavy that he succumbs. But Lanyon gives Utterson a letter before he dies. And it's to be opened after Dr. Jekyll's death or disappearance. Well, Mr. Utterson's heard that language before. That's the same language that was used in the will. When he went back and he changed the will, he said all of his possessions and his property, his wealth, his estate would go to Edward Hyde in the event of his death or disappearance. Now, if you're not dead, why would you give away all of your material goods? So this disappearance line comes up again, and that's stoking the fires in Utterson's mind, and he's trying to solve this mystery. Get behind all of this. And his goal is not to convict Mr. Hyde. It's important that you make this note. It's not to convict the bad guy. It's not to beat the bad guy of the story. It's to exonerate and free his friend, Dr. Jekyll, from any attachment to Mr. Hyde. And if you understand the whole reason behind Dr. Jekyll's experiments, he wants to create this potion to separate out from himself all that is evil, all that is dark, so that he's purely a good being, no longer tempted by the dark things 
of this life. And that is exactly what Utterson is doing as the advocate. He's not trying to convict the evil. He's just trying to make sure the good Dr. Jekyll is exonerated. That he's free to be all that he knows him to be. A month or so later, during another walk with his cousin Enfield, Utterson starts the conversation with Dr. Jekyll at his laboratory window. It's at this point that Dr. Jekyll suddenly slams the window shut and disappears. He goes back into hiding. Shortly after, Jekyll's butler, Mr. Poole, enters the story. He visits Mr. Utterson and says, Jekyll has secluded himself in his laboratory for weeks. He's hiding. He's hiding from his own staff now. He's hiding from everyone. More importantly, he's hiding himself from the world and he's hiding from himself because of what he's done in the world. It's a conflicted soul. It's a difficult place to be. But it's not too different of a place than we put ourselves in in this life. Presently in the now, if you've manifested hell, you're living in hell right now. That's what it feels like to you. And it may not look like this. This is what his hell looked like. What your hell looks like looks completely different. It's individual to each one of us. Utterson and Poole break into the laboratory where they find Hyde's body wearing Jekyll's clothes. Apparently, having killed himself. They find the letter from Jekyll to Mr. Utterson. Utterson reads Lanyon's letter, which describes what I told you before, which is Hyde revealing himself to Lanyon, taking the potion in front of him, changing back into Edward, into uh, Dr. Jekyll, and what this means for their colleague, what this means for their friend. His letter reveals Jekyll's deterioration. And his own deterioration resulted from the shock of seeing Hyde drink a serum that turned him into Jekyll. Jekyll explains in his letter that he held himself to strict moral standards publicly, but he indulged in unstated vices and struggled with shame. How many of us have indulged in vices we'd rather not talk about and felt the shame of doing it. I know that I have. I pray that you haven't. And if you haven't, I pray you never do. You never escape those things. It is what Fyodor Dostoevsky brings out in Crime and Punishment. In that novel, you follow the protagonist, the main character of the story. He gets away with murder of someone who deserved to be murdered. They didn't deserve to live by all accounts. They were an evil being, an evil person. Horrible. Terrible to everyone. He kills that person and he gets away with it. The police don't know. Nobody knows. Everybody has behind closed doors said, that was great. I'm so glad that person's dead. They didn't deserve to be here. I mean, it's actually celebrated by some. Especially those that lived in that building. What you find out is that unstated vice, that unstated thing that he did eats away at the very fabric of his being. To the point the paranoia, the fear, the guilt, the shame of it all leads him to what? He turns himself in. They don't have a bit of evidence on him. They've got nothing to convict him with. But he convicts himself. He manifested his own hell with that action. The beginning of his hell was the beginning of his act. And in that story, it's just one bad act. It's just one thing. In this book, it's really just one thing. It's the murder of a man, a sir, an upperclassman, someone of notoriety, someone important. That's going to put you on the radar. That's going to change things forever. Jekyll would say he found a way to transform himself and thereby indulge in his vices without fear of detection. 
He was hiding. Mr. Hyde was good at hiding. And he could hide all the wrongdoings and the evils that he was engaged and involved in. Jekyll's body would transform. Hyde was this evil, self-indulgent, and uncaring to anyone but himself. Initially, Jekyll controlled the transformations with the serum. So in the beginning, what you learn is, when, when Jekyll takes the serum that he's created in his experiment, it turns him into Mr. Hyde. And then he goes off and he does what he does. And then he comes back and when he wakes up the next morning, he's Dr. Jekyll again. So he has control in the beginning. In the beginning, he has control. Like anyone that ventures out into a dark vice or seedy act, you may have control in the beginning, but that's going to change hands if you don't get out of there and you don't stop what you're doing. But one night, this is what he writes in the letter, he became Hyde involuntarily in his sleep. He started to change and transform without the serum. So at this point, we have to ask ourselves, well, what defiles a person? For that, we go to Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 14. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Again, I point out, Jesus is frustrated that these guys are not getting it. They're not understanding what he's... They're not picking up what he's laying down. And you guys are... You're my guys. We're on the same team here. You know, Team Jesus, me and my disciples... You guys aren't getting this? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it enters not into his heart, but into the belly, and goes out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, Adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. If we are defiled, then what we manifest will also be defiled. If we are given over to these things, these evil thoughts, these adulteries, murders, thefts, deceit. Think you're going to create heaven out of that? Or hell? I think the latter is obviously the choice. Jekyll resolved to cease becoming Hyde in the story. He was going to put it away. He could could get rid of Hyde at any time he wanted, right? Not so. Despite his resolve and his intent to be done with Hyde, one night he had a moment of weakness and he drank the serum again. Hyde, his desires having been caged for so long, killed Carew, killed the man. So when he went into those two months of going back into his social manner and put into hiding something he refused to confront. As I've talked about before, the things you refuse to confront that you need to will turn into your catastrophe later. You will face them one way or another. It will come to a head. You either confront it within before it becomes a problem without or it becomes a problem without and now you're faced with the consequences without and within. The double whammy, the difficulties that you face on your path to disobedience are far greater 
than what you face pursuing the will of God. Horrified by killing someone. Jekyll tried more adamantly to, tr- to stop the transformations. And when he began to transform involuntarily while he was awake and asleep, he knew that his days were numbered. Far from his laboratory and hunted by the police as a murderer, Hyde needed help to avoid capture. So he wrote to Lanyon in Jekyll's hand, asking his friend to bring chemicals from his laboratory. In Lanyon's presence, Hyde mixed the chemicals like we talked about and drank the serum and transformed into Jekyll. And the shock led to his deterioration and death. Meanwhile, Jekyll's involuntary transformations increased in frequency from there and required ever larger doses of the serum to reverse. Just like us, once you get involved in something, it takes more and more and more and more of the substance or the thing that you're after to satisfy you, to give you what you originally got in just that little dabble that you could control, that you were so, so full of confidence that revealed itself to be arrogance. It was one of these transformations that caused Jekyll to slam his window shut on Utterson. So that last time that the advocate is at, your, at his window and he's talking to Dr. Jekyll and pleading with Dr. Jekyll and trying to make a connection with him and reestablish communication and bring him back into good standing again. The window shuts without explanation and we know now Jekyll had transformed back into Hyde and he didn't want his friend. He didn't want his advocate to see it you know if you have an advocate if you have a a, a legal attorney the worst thing you can do is not tell them the truth the worst thing you can do is not confide in them about what actually happened not give them the information they need to be your advocate but Jekyll had gotten used to hiding so the man that could have helped him the most he's also hiding from him eventually There was a supply of a type of salt he was using in the serum when he created it. It ran low. And the subsequent batches that he had gathered and bought from the new stocks, they failed to work. In the book, it's speculated by Jekyll that the original ingredient had some impurity in it, which is why it worked and made it happen. It was something that was unaccounted for. It wasn't part of the formula. It was just a part of one of the substances that he no longer could get a hold of. Realizing that he would stay transformed as Hyde, Jekyll wrote out a full account of the events. He locked himself in his lab, and with the intent to keep Hyde imprisoned, to keep the hider in hiding, he committed suicide by poison. And those are the letters that Lanyon and Utterson read that were addressed to both of those men. Proverbs 13, verses 13, 15 and 16 read, Good understanding gives favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Every prudent, which comes from the word arum, meaning cunning, crafty, or subtle. So every cunning, crafty, or subtle man deals with knowledge, which is from the word yada, meaning to ascertain by seeing, observation, paying attention. Mr. Utterson is the cunning, crafty, subtle man with vision. He's paying attention. He's observing what's going on. He's picking up all of the pieces. He's cobbling them together and making sense of things. But a fool layeth open, which comes from the word paras, meaning breaks apart, scatters, or spreads his folly. Now this is a play on words that was unintended, but it's really cool. Is <laughs> A fool layeth open his evil. E-V-I-Y-L is the word in the Hebrew. Which means perverseness or foolishness. So a fool spreads his foolishness. Spreads his perverseness. So it's not just them. It's everyone that it spreads to. It's everything that it spreads to. And we know that's the way of a fool, thanks to Proverbs. And we've talked a lot about Proverbs. The reason for that is because it is a book about individual faith. This is an individual journey for each of us. 
that we have to work through. We have to give ourselves to. We have to bring ourselves to these places. It's my hope that these stories have revealed to you all that heaven or hell is a choice. And God has placed you as the hero and adversary of your own reality. Which will you manifest? Understanding that the structure of this world is divided into negative and positive elements represented by chaos, nature, and culture, the individual, you, is more precisely in combat within their own heart between the heaven of their manifestation and the hell of their manifestation. This is the juxtaposition of power versus competence. Power tilts towards tyranny, which will lead you to a hell of your own making. Competence tilts towards love and truth and will lead you to a heaven of your own making. Stevenson, via Dr. Jekyll's last note to Utterson, regarding his attempt to separate the positive and negative elements of himself, read like this, If each I told myself housed in separate identities, if I told myself housed in separate identities, life would be relieved of all that was unbearable. The unjust might just go his way. Delivered from the aspirations and remorse of his more upright twin. And the just could walk steadfastly and securely on his upward path, doing the good things in which he found his pleasure and no longer exposed to disgrace and penitence by the hands of extraneous evil. Unfortunately, these polar twins were bound together in the agonized womb of consciousness and continuously struggle. As Jekyll saw it at the end, all human beings, as we meet them, are commingled out of good and evil. The hero is awake, attentive. He communicates. He bears responsibility to keep the tyrant at bay. They are aware of their own faults and their proclivities for malevolence and deceit to maintain proper alignment with the sacred and their purpose for being. The adversarial person adopts the despicable and contemptible within themselves and manifested by others to some degree and otherwise learned through stories. If you go through this life unaware that the treasure you need is guarded by a dragon or that beautiful nature can turn its teeth on you in a moment or that peaceful society you take for granted is threatened constantly by tyranny or that you contain within yourself the adversary who may wish that all these negative transformations of you occur, then you are firstly a hell-manifesting acolyte for any ideology that will give you a wholly insufficient representation of reality that carries the illusion of safety. Let me read that again. If you were all those things, if you take for granted that your treasure is guarded by a dragon, if you don't come to the truth that beautiful nature can turn its teeth on you in a moment, if you don't come to the understanding that the peaceful society you take for granted is constantly under threat of tyranny, and if you don't appreciate and integrate the truth that you yourself have the adversary of your life within that wishes all of these negative transformations to occur, then firstly, you are a hell-manifesting acolyte for any ideological idea or ideological possession or ideology that will give you a wholly insufficient representation of reality that carries the illusion of safety. So firstly, you're an individual who relies on whatever doctrine, whatever ideology, whatever philosophy allows you to see the world in a way that allows you to be evil. That allows you to be nihilistic. That allows you to hide from God. Hide from the presence of God in your true calling. Secondly, 
A willfully blind person is what you are. And you've become dangerous to yourself and others. That is life and death. Heaven and hell. And it's pure chaos of reality that destroys our hard-won certainties. But it is also the prophet-swallowing whale who grants wisdom and rebirth even if it kills you. Jekyll describes what we have discussed today in terms of heaven and hell, which dealing with the duality within oneself to realize that we're not a duality. We're a unified being. That it's not my bad versus my good, and one of them wins and exiles the other. It's that my good and my bad have to work together for good. My good and my bad have to come together where Darkness is light to me, and light is darkness. And it doesn't matter what I'm operating in. I know that I'm operating in truth. I know that I'm operating in alignment with the sacred. I know that I'm operating to manifest a heaven. And then it's not by whatever means necessary. It's by the means of love and truth that we get there. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde demonstrate the awareness that choices will either manifest heaven or manifest hell for him. And to that point, it reads like this in the book. To cast in my lot with Jekyll was to die to those appetites which I had long secretly indulged and had of late began to pamper. To cast it in with Hyde was to die, a, uh, to, die to a thousand interests and aspirations. To become at a blow and forever despised, and friendless. See, even Jekyll knew that when attempting to separate these polar twins within, that sacrifice and suffering remain. And utopian ideas fail. What we take from this is the truth that making the proper sacrifices and enduring the suffering in the pursuit of meaning and our purpose in God to manifest heaven. And heaven is not a utopia. It's proper alignment with the sacred that leads us through sacrifices and suffering to appreciate the heaven of our own making because God's love never fails. Psalm 139, verses 3, 5, 7, and 8, 10, and 12. And in speaking with Pastor Kev about these, he chose to skip several verses to emphasize the acknowledgement of the believer's origins. And to substantiate that there is no hell or darkness or otherwise where God is not presently seeking us. Stop hiding from God and hide your hell, darkness, and otherwise within you in Him. And become what you're supposed to be. Verse 3 reads, Thou compassedest, thou compassed my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid Thine hand upon me. Whither shall I go from Thy Spirit? Or whither shall I flee from Thy presence? That's the understanding we get from Jonah. Why would I do those things? I know what that looks like. And I'd rather not go down that path. If I ascend up into heaven, Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, Thou art there. Even there shall thy hand lead me. Whether that's heaven or hell. It doesn't say if it's heaven or hell there. It gets into the, the Scripture before it says, if I'm in heaven, you're there. If I'm in hell, you're there. So even there, either way, shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee and the night shineth as the day. And the darkness and light are both alike to thee. Amen. We're not a duality. God is not a duality. It's not a trilogy. It's not a trinity. We're talking about unity. We're talking about a coming together of all things into one understanding. One meaning. One purpose. That's truth and love for all. That's why we need mercy. That's why we need the mercy seat. 
We need forgiveness. We need grace. Because we're all in this together. Individually, but together. It's in our individual capacity to confront the potential of the future and transform it into the actuality of the present. The way we determine what, is, what, what it is that the world transforms into is a consequence of our ethical conscious choices. The ego's proper mediation of the id and superego within. We all have to make the decision to confront each day with all its possibilities and all of its suffering. We have to make the decision for better or for worse now. 2 Corinthians 6 2. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We accept the darkness and light with all their potentials, knowing the disasters that block the way of disobedience are harder than the difficulties in performing God's will. Knowing full well and living the belief and faith in the sacred that we have been gifted with the opportunity in this life to do good and bring about heaven or do evil and bring about hell. Which will you choose? I love Him because He first loved me. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Visit our subsplash. We're available on all streaming platforms now through that app and that application. Look for the Gathering Echo, and we will see you all next time. Thank you.